Welcome. Really excited to be here with you. I am very passionate about gender. Um, I'm more of a gender expert, so keep me honest that I pull in enough of the, the Asian perspective. But I know um, for many of you, you know, you've been thinking a lot about um, diversity around Asians, and so this is really bringing that lens of gender to the, to the thinking. Um, and we have, we're very lucky to have two great folks here. We have Seema and Neil. I'm gonna quickly introduce them. And then what I'd like to do is just provide a couple of facts for you, just so we can kind of ground ourselves in the current state, and then mostly pull on their expertise um, from two really big names when it comes to diversity. Great, so first is Seema Kumar. So she is the Vice President of Innovation, Global Health and Science Policy Communication at Johnson & Johnson. And she drives Johnson & Johnson's reputation as a pioneer and a partner of choice in um, innovation, research and development, and in public health. So she also leads NRI enterprise-wide communications internally for Johnson & Johnson's for all of these really critical topics and others. Um, and she, we're really excited to have her here. She's a successful Asian woman, um, and she's also really passionate about mentoring women and minorities. So welcome, Seema. Thank you. And Neil Jacoby, also in New Yorker here, is an Associate VP for Public Affairs at AT&T. He's based in New York, and he develops um, the campaigns for positioning AT&T in New the New York market as a thought leader of applying mobile technologies for human, social, and community purpose. It's an excellent, interesting role. So one of his most recent um, projects, of many really interesting ones, is he created a global innovation contest to source mobile technology serving people with disabilities. Um, we're really excited, excited to have Neil here as a perspective. We all know that um, white male allies are um, critical in, in diversity, and we oftentimes have the conversation just with women or just with Asians, and we know that's not the path forward, right? That's not how we're gonna make real change. So thank you both for being here. Um, I'm gonna, oh, I wanted to chat, so who's in the room? Just so, um, this is actually the first conference for, for the three of us, so we'd love to know how many folks have been to um, DLF in the past? Nice, so we've got a couple of vets, a couple of new faces, um, and any, any out-of-towners? Nice, welcome to New York. New York, who is involved in an Asian ERG in your company? Oh good, so lots of folks that have done that. And has anyone here done a lot of work with the women's initiatives at your companies? Oh good, so we've got great minds. So we'll have some questions at, um, some time for questions at the end as well, so, so keep those coming. All right, so I'll jump into a couple of facts. Let's see if I can get this going. That's us. <laughs> Okay, so um, I was recently, as well recently, 2015, McKinsey did a report at the McKinsey Global Institute um, on the power of gender parity. And when you think about change and cultural transformation, the first thing is how do you create like a really simple narrative about why something matters? So these are pretty big numbers. We looked at, um, it was 95 countries that make up 97% of GDP. And we thought, you know, what would it look like to actually close the gender cap? So we've done this um, analysis in a couple of ways. I don't want to get too academic, um, but I did bring some reports for any of the other dorky. I'm an economist, um, so the other macroeconomists in the room can check that out. Um, but the big levers here are labor force participation. That's you know typically the obvious one. But you'd be surprised, even in the United States, there's a $2, billion, a $2 trillion opportunity from maintaining the labor force participation. It's currently, I think it's 72, 74% for women. Um, the other factor is that women um, you are typically a disproportionately take the part-time roles. So I think 65% of part-time roles in the United States are women. Um, and the other piece is the sectors. There's been a lot of articles recently about where women, you know, wh wh what are we studying? And oftentimes um, it's more in terms of, um, you know, we've got the teachers, we've got educators so in terms of education. And you can imagine more broadly in the global economy what that means is women in developing countries being more um, in agriculture versus industry. So that's, that's where it makes up a ton of that difference there. And so the two numbers, 28 trillion, is if we close that gap completely. And 12 trillion is if you just look across each region, so let's take Asia, who's best in class there, and what's, what are the best rates there? Let's just bring everybody up to that, that regional standard. Still a huge opportunity. Great. So, I, I, have, I have lots of spreadsheets of great information. So if you're really, I mean, so there's a global report. Um, I brought the US report just because I had those on hand. And so check those out. And obviously, you know, I'm happy to chat if anybody wants to, to talk, talk numbers afterwards. Um, 
So the next piece is we also have a, a partnership with, with Lean In. You know, so Cheryl's been really big in terms of the gender, gender equality space. And um, they, we did a survey of 132 companies, and we said, you know, what's the current experience of women in corporate America? So now we're, that went from global to just the United States. Um, and when we look at the trends, the first thing we see is that we won't get gender equality or gender parity at the top levels of, of companies for another hundred years based on current trends. My first thought with a hundred years was like, oh, that's just one lifetime, right? No big deal. When you think about where the United States was a hundred years ago, right, 1917, women didn't have the right to vote yet. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act ended in like the 19, 1943. Um, Japanese internment happened in 1946. Uh, so. Imagine a hundred years forward, how crazy and different the marketplace will be. And it, it's it's amazing to think that it will take that long. You know, that's like I don't what is that? Our great 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 grandchildren or something like that. So um, I'm excited to hear more about how do we you know bend that arc faster and, and move us to equality faster. And and these companies are really moving us there much faster than than the, the rest of the crowd. Um, don't want to take too much time, but here's you know here's a quick uh, view of the pipeline. It's it's sort of the numeric view, just so we know where we're starting from. Um, but I think more interesting um, than the view of men and women is you know when we start to look at mm -hmm. white men, men of color, white women, and women of color, we can start to pull out where is gender affecting the workforce and where is race and ethnicity affecting the workplace, and you know. We know that in terms of, so that women of color sliver, and that's that's a new cut for this report, so I'm excited for, for future versions where we hopefully dig even deeper. But um, Asians, Latinos, Black, and Native Indians, right? So even if you take into consideration that um, in terms of um, graduation rates, we have really high levels of graduation rates for Asian women. Um, when you look at how quickly that goes from, what is that, like 16, 18% to 1% at the top, and we know that to be true, right, when we look upwards in our organizations, um, we know that there's a huge opportunity, right? It's, it's a loss of talent, um, and, and, it's, and there's a real business case for that for companies. Great, so, oops. With that, let's, you know, I don't want to be like the bearer of terrible news. It's, the, the current state is not amazing, but, you know, but we know that that's actually great progress. And let's talk about what to do about it. So we'd love to hear, hear you know, what are the big initiatives happening at AT&T and Johnson & Johnson? And I think we know that for the last decade, companies have been doing a lot of the same. What do you think is really working? Like, which are the ones that are really moving the needle? Still? Mm -hmm. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Is this working? Let's see. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Perfect. Great. So good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here and um, see so many Asian women in this room. It's 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 really lovely. Um, you know, I, I think that this these these issues that you've highlighted, I think they we do. It's not a scaremongering, but we do need to keep them front and center because this is the motivation for how why we need to continue making progress. So. Um, I will speak from not only my experience at Johnson & Johnson, but in other places as well. But um, starting with Johnson & Johnson, uh, one of the things that we recently launched uh, is what we call the We STEM 2D initiative. So STEM, I think everybody's aware of STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, and then 2D means STEM, uh, I'm sorry, mathematics. So then we added manufacturing, because there are many engineers in manufacturing and design, which is a new field uh, that I, you know, again, many women are now entering design. So it's STEM plus the another M, uh, D, and then WI is women in STEM 2D. So what we did was we focused, first of all, on uh, three pillars, the K through 12. Uh, the middle pillar is much more of the undergraduate and graduate students, university level. Uh, and then on the third pillar is the professional uh, working women. Uh, and we've been looking at doing number crunching of our own uh, women in our own uh, organization, but also, you know, what's the pool out there? So at the end of the day, there are two things that, that come up. One is that uh, we are doing a lot, and I think we are making a lot of improvements. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, but if we look at ourselves against the pool, we're doing much better than, quote unquote, you know, where the pools are. And so one of the key insights is that we really not only need to work on our own organization, 
but we need to work on the ecosystem. We need to work on the pool. So if there isn't enough of, the, of a pool, where are we going to draw that talent from? And if we want to create that talent, we need to work on the ecosystem. So a few things I'll mention. We have, uh, I think like many corporations, I'm sure you guys do too, uh, enterprise resource groups. So we have the largest women's leadership initiative, um, which is global initiative. Yeah, so we have several chapters across Johnson & Johnson, but then a big uh, executive um, uh, women's leadership, which is sort of at the, the VP and higher level. And then we have chapters all over the, all over the world. But we also have um, ERGs. So we have, that's the enterprise resource groups uh, for, I think most of you know what they are. They are uh, associations of people from a similar background. So we have uh, two societies in, within Johnson & Johnson. One is called Asia Society. Uh, it's Asians from all over. And then we have something called SAPNA. Uh, SAPNA is a South Asian Professional Networks Association, which is uh, people from South Asia, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and many of the South Asian countries. So we get together and part of, one of the things we used to do a long time ago uh, is we would just get together and have tea and samosas and chit chat, uh, but then we realized quickly, you know, that is not enough. That, you know, on, at the, it gives you a safe environment and, uh, you know, feel like you belong, but really we need to be at about a higher purpose. How are we bringing issues of South Asians or issues of Asians uh, to the mix? And so we have an executive sponsor, and our executive sponsor until recently was a white male. He's now retiring from Johnson. He's on the executive committee of Johnson & Johnson. We now have another executive uh, sponsor, and that's, he's also a white male. So speaking of white males, important um, um, uh, uh, you know, a stakeholder to have there. Uh, but we started focusing on talent, on mentorship, on um, the championship of people, two-way championship of people, and giving people more of um, the not only the tools and techniques, but also uh, development and coaching and mentoring uh, from people that they have who have gone through similar experiences. Last thing I'll say is, when it comes to women, the usual things. We, these are all things that have been shown to be important, but it's amazing how many places still don't have that. That is generous family leave policy, not just maternity leave, but paternity leave, which is an important support mechanism for women. Flexible work environment so that you can work around, you know, whatever your other priorities are in your work-life balance. Childcare on-site, fitness on-site, um, and coaching on-site. So all of those things, some of the things I'll mention. And of course, the culture is a big, important part of it. Oh, you have a yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I could I could pick up on a couple of points um, that were just made and, and reflect on my experience at AT and T and our culture. And I do agree that that's uh, an absolutely essential part, um, both culture and and seeing people like you in leadership. Um, and and so AT and T um, has made a lot of progress. We're doing great. We have more to do. Um, we also have a, a very robust ERG organization in our company. Half of our employees are members. Um, and and at and is a unique company in, in a couple of respects. We are a technology company um, where we have a lot of effort around encouraging women and supporting women and pursuing STEM careers. We count currently 18,000 uh, women who are in STEM fields um, within at and um, But we're an enormous company. We have 264,000 employees and um, unique also because a lot of them are frontline. People, uh, workers going into people's homes uh, to provide connectivity, folks who are in stores and retail. And so we have this enormous spectrum of, of career at AT&T from the frontline all the way up to the executive level in, in an enormous array of businesses. And so that presents both incredible opportunities uh, for folks to, to literally climb the ladder of leadership and, and some of the most amazing stories by our uh, female leaders, executives, are, are, are women who have been with the company 20, 30 years and, and started in one role and eventually made their way up. And, and that's, a, that's part of our culture. Um, we like to hire folks and we like to keep folks to retain talent and to retain talent that, that depends on seeing people like you and having the reinforcement and support that you need to stay engaged and motivated and, and feel good about your career prospects. 
Um, it also presents challenges, too, by having such a diverse workforce in terms of the functions that our employees uh, perform all throughout the entire value chain of what we provide in all these different industries um, demands a, an enormously inclusive environment. Um, we have to be uh, respectful of all these different backgrounds and, and incorporate those perspectives into our business product because for us to sell to this huge um, market, our, our services at the consumer level, at the enterprise level, in the small business and government, everywhere in between, we need to incorporate the viewpoints and the knowledge that um, our workforce brings to the table into those products and services. Um, and so that presents a, a logistical and operational challenge. And in my experience personally, what, what I have seen at at and and I think what I'm most proud of, is in order to achieve that um, blend of perspectives and have them reflected in our products and services demands real collaboration um, and, and team building. You know, there's no, uh, you know, lone wolf, you know, people don't, this is, uh, you know, what well, we have an entrepreneurial, we have to have an entrepreneurial culture. Everything's done in groups and teams, um, cross organizational, cross business units. Um, and, and admittedly, some of our business units are as big as some major corporations. You know, we have a market capitalization over $260 billion. Um, every quarter we report somewhere from 32 to $33 billion in revenue. Um, and I'm proud to say one, a colleague that I know, unfortunately she moved to Dallas where our headquarters is Ann Chow, uh, Asian American. She manages a, a $15 billion P&L in her group alone. And so these are enormous enterprises within the broader company. Um, and so to be able to collaborate across those units is a big challenge, but it's necessary. Um, for us to sell to a university or sell to a customer who walks into our store or to a major customer, an enterprise client like a Johnson & Johnson, um, demands that our services sort of meet our customers where they are. And their expectation is that we're inclusive and supportive and that our products are meeting the particular needs of the different communities that we serve. And so I, you know, I think and we'll, we'll continue this conversation quite a bit more, I hope. But I, I think the key takeaway in the learning that I've had at at and is how at times arduous the collaboration can be. I mean, it's real work. You have to, you have to really try. To, to reach out, to build relationships, to cultivate and maintain relationships across business units. But the outcome of that, of that work is a product and a service um, that really speaks to the perspectives of the broad markets that we serve. Um, and, and that's how at and blends it all. We have, we have to, we have no choice. We serve everyone. We're kind of like, in a sense, you know, I, I, we're, we're a major corporate hubs, Dallas, Atlanta, LA, New York, um, but yet we're in every town and every county in America. We have employees literally everywhere. So it's, this presents this enormous organizational challenge, but also this enormous market benefit of tapping into all those different regional cultural differences and blending them into our products. Great, and I, so I love that thought in terms of collaboration. and. You know, you, you mentioned some of like the classic go-to moves in terms of really thinking about diversity and inclusion, both for gender and diversity. When we look at diversity and inclusion, typically there it is, I mean, that's that in and of itself is very siloed, right? We've got the black network, the Hispanic network, the Asian network, and then separately, um, the women's group, right? And, and so have you seen any, any best ways of like bringing that together? Because we know that, it, is, it, is it, do we work you know, within the women's group across and think more about diversity, bring that more in there? Do we think more about gender when we go to the diversity groups? Is it both? Like, how do we really get to the fact that, you know, there, there is this piling on of some of those um, those social expectations of, you know, like, first I'm, you know, a lady and I need to act a certain way and work across that. And then on top of that, I think we know culturally, um, Asian cultures can be even more traditional when it comes to gender norms. Um, so how do you even start to address that sort of, that intersection when you think about these broad diversity programs, is it applicable to, to everyone or do you start to become more nuanced with the group? And if you want to take that first, or I'm happy. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, um, none of us wakes up any specific day and says, you know, okay, today I'm an Indian, tomorrow <laughs> I'm an American, the day after tomorrow I'm a woman, after that I'm, you know, a lady, whatever. It, it's it's it, it, you know we don't divide ourselves up like that. We are a fully whole individual, 
And I think it's a farce to actually divide up ERGs that way. Now that said, uh, you do want to, uh, it's about inclusion, right? You want to go to a place where you feel like you belong. And so to that extent, I think the, having those ERG groups really makes a difference. What we have done at J&J is um, not only our own ERG groups, but external ERG groups. And depending on the topic of interest, we collaborate across the groups. So sometimes it, ha it's, it has to do with an Asia theme, you know? And then you bring the men, the women, even people who have lived in Asia, they may not be of Asian origin, bring everybody who is involved into it to have a dialogue. So instead of by uh, ethnicity or by gender or whatever, or whatever, we focus it on topics. Now that said, there are reasons to still have the, the things that are by gender, but because if you are discussing women's issues, men are welcome, but that particular topic lends itself to that. So we've done those kinds of collaborations where we bring in different kinds of groups, and then the Asia group actually is a combination of all of the different groups. Uh, and then we have a diversity forum, which has to do with HOLA, which is our Hispanic group, um, ALAC, which is our African American group. So all the leaders of all of those groups come together and our CEO and our chief diversity officer uh, meet to say, okay, what are some of the issues that you are hearing uh, from your various groups? So there's a representative from each of those groups and we have those informal conversations um, just to sort of have a pulse check on how are we doing. And most recently we had that pulse check because of all of the changes in the landscape we were seeing across the world where we felt that we needed to continue to hammer home that we as a company believe and still embrace all of the values around diversity and inclusion. Lest somebody not fear that the world around us there's all kinds of rhetorics flying around everywhere around the world. And so let's just be grounded in our value systems and that value system still believes in diversity and inclusion. Well, I think it's, <clears throat> the, the, the question was, we've got all these different groups segmented, right? And, and you know, a, I, I know that from our ERGs as well, we have different um, ethnic groups in that. And course. Neil's an expert on collaboration across sectors, so I'm really excited to hear, you know, how you, how you think about that. Well, it's, I think fundamentally it comes down to, <laughs> to leadership, right? And so our chairman, Randall Stevenson, um, he chairs our company's diversity and, uh, diversity and, and inclusion council. Um, so he sets the tone. Um, that this isn't just an expectation. This is who we are as a company, and, and our, like I said before, our you know our customers demand it uh, because of the breadth of our of our marketplace. Um, so I, I do think it comes from leadership, and and AT and T has uh, for women um, organized several key initiatives to identify very high potential um, executives or future executives, and has created a whole. Uh, chain of initiatives designed exclusively for supporting and providing coaching um, and mentoring. Um, I myself am a, am a mentor uh, to three employees. Um, I make a focus on um, outside my geography. I think that's I think that's an important part of it. So I have um, a, a young woman I work with in, in in Georgia, another woman in Alabama, and uh, also another gentleman in Georgia. So the, the three of us. Um, speak regularly and check in and, and get involved in their work. Um, I think that's very important. Um, it's both good for me, right, because I can learn from them and I have learned tremendously from my mentees, um, but I see this at every level above me and below me that this is, this is the expectation. Um, and our chairman does mentor himself, um, employees, and helps provide coaching, but also business acumen. Really, that's really what it comes down to is, is we've got to win in the marketplace. This is a very competitive marketplace. And so for women um, in Asian Pacific Islanders to, under, to be part of that uh, coaching pool um, is good for our company because it increases the, the pool of candidates who we can draw on to promote. And so this is, this is an aggressive, aggressive initiative for our company. Um, a third of our workforce is women, uh, made up of women. So we, we've, got a, we've got a way to go got some work to do. Um, we do need more representation in our executive ranks. And so um, 
a couple of the initiatives. So I want to explain it specifically what they are. So we've got um, a program for our, our MBA students, um, students or employees who, who, who've obtained an MBA, uh, providing um, insights into businesses. Um, a couple steps up uh, for, for particularly female employees, um, there's the Executive Women's Leadership Experience at at and um, This focuses in on our highest performing um, and the highest potential women and provides them with visibility and access to leadership. Um, and that's, that's absolutely critical. It's one thing to attend training courses and to learn about the P&L and learn about our market, but it's to, to learn it directly from an executive who manages the P&L. Um, and I, think, I, th I do think visibility is, is part of what the leadership imparts. The, the next step above that um, is a much smaller cohort of, of individuals um, who, females who, who are um, from that cohort from the, the uh, executive women's leadership experience um, identified as, as having executive and officer potential. Um, and these work directly with our senior most executives, our SVPs, um, representing various business units and roundtable discussions um, where they're encouraged to challenge assumptions about the company, to, to challenge uh, business practice and models. Um, and to um, and to just just learn about the company in, in, in a way where where their opinions are valued and they can feel comfortable and that's good for for our leadership right we, we need to be challenged we're challenged every day um, in the marketplace and, and our executives need to feel the heat internally and listen and and take in the perspectives that are so important to shaping our business decisions and the strategic decisions that we make and so i'd say leadership mentoring um inclusion but also demonstrating it through promotion i mean you you, you gotta you gotta demonstrate it by putting women in, in asian pacific islanders in positions of authority in the company where they can they can prove their their comparable worth and ability to, to, to perform and be excellent just like anyone else can. Um, and we're doing that and it's it's just, it takes time. I love that point about making sure that you are promoting and you know, one of the questions we asked folks was, um, you, do you think that the best opportunities go to the, the most well-deserving people, right? So we know diversity is just having different people in the room, but inclusion is feeling that you really are valued and that it, it's a true meritocracy and not, you know, just the, a meritocracy in theory. And so we know um, just under half of white women, women believe that to be true, whereas 29% of black women believe that the best opportunities go to the, those most deserving, 41% uh, of Hispanic and 43% of Asian. So what are those bold things that a company can do to make sure that promotions and advancements and even recruitment feel and truly are fair? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think it goes back to the original point I was making in the opening remarks, which is um, we, you know, we can do things to sort of showcase women who are promoted or Asian women who are promoted or uh, uh, an African-American male or female promoted. Uh, but at the end of the day, one um, appointment, one promotion, while it can be uh, a showcase is not enough, right? We, we really need to broad breath, make big, big impact and big changes. And those changes, to make those changes, we should have been working 20 years ago. Um, because today, if I want to go up and find a surgical oncologist who can resect a lung cancer, and I'm going and saying, okay, I want to find an Asian woman who does that, my pool of finding that kind of a person would only be possible if 20 years ago we had trained you know, many people in that <clears throat> arena. So today we don't have, especially in those specialized areas, uh, people, and I use that just as one example, but when it's, a, when it's a job description that has a specific need, such as in oncology or in surgery or something like that, you, you can't just pick anybody. Somebody has to have done surgery. So when you go more and more specialized like that in healthcare, the pool gets smaller and smaller, the number of people you can. So recently we waited for a year and a half and we made the commitment for a bigger, we, we wanted to hire somebody who was a woman because we had all male leadership in that one particular team. And it took us a year and a half to, to, to find it and we were determined that we were not gonna just go for. But my point being that 
for us to not be in the same panel discussion 20 years from now and saying why are we not making progress and you typically the human resources department will tell you that the pool of candidates that they have um, let's say African American or Hispanic or Asian or whatever that there's so few of them to draw from that everybody's competing and there is a war on talent for for all of this same thing with board positions um, etc uh, that you'll see in venture capital um, industry that they're fighting to figure out a way to get more women on board board positions exact etc so my point being that we we are not there yet because we didn't do the work that was needed 20 years ago and so we need to do the work now we still should of course that shouldn't stop us from trying and making all of these changes and making making those promotions but I think we didn't do the work that was needed 20 years ago and we need to do start now for so my you know I don't have a daughter I only have a son but <laughs> my niece or future, whoever, future yes exactly he is <laughs> he is um, will will be able to um, and the grandchildren will be able to take on those kinds of uh, bigger make bigger impact and changes yeah no I, I, I agree with that completely and um, AT&T uh, as a technology company and, and as a media company, we are uh, investing aggressively in um, encouraging careers in uh, STEM education, um, careers in the STEM fields rather, um, among our youngest learners. Um, we, we have an enormous philanthropic portfolio that's focused almost entirely on education, serving the highest needs need communities at a very local level. Um, so as we are sort of a company that's global but very local, uh, we also have education programs in, in most of these towns and cities where we have a customer base um, serving at-risk youth and young people who are at risk of dropping out from high school, particularly at that critical freshman to sophomore year, um, which tends to be a place where young people drop out. So encouraging young people to stay in school um, and encouraging young people, particularly women, uh, to pursue careers in coding and engineering. Um, we're, we're a very aggressive supporter of the organization Girls in Code um, and several other coding organizations all throughout the company, our country, uh, that provide summer camp, uh, after school um, initiatives to introduce young people to careers in engineering, uh, women I should say rather, careers in engineering who might not have ever thought of it. Um, and, and this isn't just in service of our own company, we do hire. Um, some of the young people who come out of the programs that we support, but it's really just in service of the country. I mean, we've got to diversify um, our, our leadership ranks and, and do it um, from bottom up, um, both the initiatives that I described that support uh, women who are, who are along their way and have, have made it to an executive or leadership level to general manager or vice president level in their company to give them the support, encouragement, and insight that they need to go on to, to a much higher level but also to, to look very broadly at how to get people into careers to begin with. Um, because like I said, you know, a lot of people stay at a company like at t for a very long time. I'm sure that's true of J&J too. Uh, it is many of our, our big Fortune 10, Fortune 100 companies. There's, there's a, it's a long track record of staying there. And that's for a reason. There's security, um, they're good jobs, um, they're exciting jobs. Um, but, but for our company to survive, given our, um, I should say rather for our company to excel, um, given our, our consumer base, we need to diversify. Uh, we have to reflect the population that we serve. And so that, there's a lot of emphasis on, on encouraging women leadership and also just encouraging uh, people to consider careers in these industries who might not otherwise. Um, to, to do what you're saying, yeah. right? So 20 exactly. years from now, this is not as, as, as glaring an issue as it is today. Exactly, and so we need to be working on the K through 12, and we need to be working on the university. So we have to work through the entire pipeline, so that that pipeline starts to look, you know, like like an actual pipe and not a funnel. Yeah. And um, and uh, but I w one of the th things that you said also sparked a thought for me, which is that inclusion is just as important as those promotions and diversity, because what happens is that. Um, in many places, people might get that job or might get that promotion and then they go to the boardroom or the leadership team meeting 
and then they realize, oh my god, I am the odd one out here. And then you don't feel that, and, and unless you put as much uh, focus on inclusion, that person will probably leave. Yeah. And it's more true of your generation. Because you guys are not, you know, not like us staying in one place for a long time. You guys move around a lot. Okay, I'm on job six already. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I, just a couple of practical tips. I know, you know, in term, when you think about um, people thinking that the process is fair, there's a lot of big, bold things that companies can do. I know we hear a lot about unconscious bias, right? But is training enough? So, you know, are you having experts really look at the performance evaluation itself within your company to make sure bias isn't built into the system. Um, you know, the recruiting process is being, you know, really locked down. I, you know, you hear stories of, you know, how was your interview? And I said, great. You know, when I came out of my MBA and my friend was like, yeah, me too. I had so much fun. Me and this guy, we just talked about scotch and he just loved me. You know, those types of things are not okay in terms of knowing that we have unbiased, really clear approaches for both how we bring in and promote people. So you still hear those kind of like, you know, yeah. we're, we have the best intentions, but you've got to bring everybody along who's running that process, right? So, you know, we have we've rolled out unconscious bias training throughout our company. And I think where we are, not just as a company, but just as a world, is how do we systematize it so that when you get resumes, can you uh, white out the name? So it's immediately not clear, this is Joe whatever, or Shirley Ma, or Seema Kumar, <laughs> you know? Um, so you know, you, you're not already biased when you see the, the resume, the name of the person, and many other things like that, which uh, things like, you know, the men mostly used to quote unquote get the, the myth or reality, who knows, is that, oh, if you, if you go, went and played a couple of rounds of golf, then, you know, you, you know you, you're incre that increases your chances of promotion, then how do you, uh, you know, uh, um, how do you correct for that? Um, so I think we have the awareness now of unconscious bias, but the, I think what we as a society have not yet fully cracked is how do we systematize it uh, during the hiring process, interview process, promotion process. Yeah, and so I wanted to really dig in on that because I think I think what we've seen, especially some of our research looking at companies, when you look at which programs they have in place, you can check almost every box, yep. right? And it's it's really about that execution. And so, how do you bring? I think we've talked about this. There's folks that are really excited about diversity inclusion. There's folks that are a little bit apathetic and don't want to engage at all. And then there's the people that are really hostile and just think that it's a bunch of hooey and why do we even care about it? And you know, you talk about these innovation numbers, but it still just like doesn't make, you know, it's just crazy to me. So how do you really bring along the whole company? You know, obviously leadership matters, but there's there's all these folks across the way that have different viewpoints. And I know both of you are experts in communications and really making sure the message lands. Well, I, 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 I think it comes back to the, to the tone and the message sent by the leadership. And I, I keep coming back to this um, because I, I've seen the impact that it's had on AT&T um, that if, if you're hostile to it, there's probably not a place for you in our company. Um, and that's, that's, that's just who we are um, in, in we have a real long history, and I don't need to get into it, with the ERGs and, and our inclusion and our support of our LGBTQ employees and employees from all these different backgrounds. Um, and we're really proud of that. But I think what really comes to mind when you were, when you were saying this just now was was our ERG conference last September. Um, it's 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 the thing to go to at AT and T if you if you can get a ticket. Um, we have uh, Dallas every year in September um, for all the ERGs to come, and it is the hot ticket. And employees pay their own way to go there. This is not something where where the company um, will accept expenses uh, to go there. So this is and it over it sells out immediately um, when the tickets go on sale to the conference and the event. And and it's it's the place to be to meet informally with our officers and our leadership of our company. They're out and about mingling in the event. It's in our headquarters city. And I went last year for the first time. Um, I had some programs um, that I, I was running that were relevant to, to some of what was going on there. And I just could not believe just the, the interaction, the visibility that I had with, with leadership. And there was a couple of key connections that I made that proved to be very valuable in the work that I do. I was able to call on some folks for some favors on support. Um, 
So that speaks to the tone and the leadership, that it is that high level. Our, last year, our, our chairman, Randall Stevenson, um, uh, was the keynote speaker um, at, the, at the big dinner, and um, he really surprised uh, the audience uh, with this, his remarks, and it was all about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and about he and his, his own experience um, really addressed his own white privilege. Um, and, and this is from our chairman and our CEO um, speaking to our ERGs. And so he sent a very powerful message to his direct reports, to the leadership, and, and to the whole rank and file of the company of where he stands and, and what our values are about inclusion. Um, and, and we're so proud of him and his leadership. And it starts with him. Um, and it's, it's evident with, with the folks who report to him and the businesses that they run that um, you know, we are changing. Our country is changing. We have to change with the country, and that demands um, an attention and aggressiveness to this question of inclusion. That's not just checking the boxes, as you said, but it demands, you know, it demands promotion, it demands access, visibility, investment, um, and so, so it's it's a it's it, it comes from leadership, I think, fundamentally. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think you know at the end of the day, role modeling and leadership and culture, ha, you know, makes makes it all happen. Again, same thing with J&J, a company that's been around for 130 years, and I think seven of our first 11 employees were women, and um, you know, we still sort of look back at those black and white pictures and say, oh my God, we were progressive even then. Um, Partly a joke, you know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> and and uh, I think we um, several things. So first of all, we have something called the credo, the Johnson and Johnson credo, which is our sort of value system. It's something that you will find in every office. It's not a mission statement. It was written 76 years ago by General Johnson when the company f was first going public, and he needed to feel like he was explaining to shareholders and the public what this company was all about and its ethos and its value systems and that that was sort of an agreement with shareholders and the public that this is how we will operate and these are our values. Everybody, it, and it's, no, it's not like a document, it is something that everybody lives up to. And if you go read that document, and we have a credo challenge every year, we look at the document and the challenge is see what words you want to change and bring to the 21st century and we find ourselves not changing barely a word uh, because it is so beautifully written that this man was a visionary. But the reason I bring that up is that it's a, it's a cultural part of, our, of the company. That's part of its leadership. Our CEO and our leadership team and all of us, you know, we're very much about diversity and inclusion. Third is um, from a business perspective, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. And so, if I deliver great results, but I don't have embraced those value systems, then my performance and compensation is not only about the what I deliver, but the how I deliver it. And so we measure, we have diversity and inclusion criteria, we measure it, so what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. It's only one, right? Inclusion is a big part, there's a lot of nuances, but. It's a first step, that's one. And the second thing is le our leadership is assessed on our ability to live up to our aspiration of diversity. So, so, and so it's a, the credo gives us, gives us the moral imperative for why we need to be. The business gives us the business imperative for why this is important and for us to you know, grow as a company. I think both of you are in incredible organizations that really value it. I don't know if you know everyone here, you know, when you see something going wrong, you feel uncomfortable about the way that your company's run, or maybe your 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 executive or your credo is just really not inclusive. Do you have any advice for folks? Did I say Siri? Oh. <laughs> Siri, Alexa. Um, do you have any advice for folks who want to be an advocate for this? You know, maybe their the environment isn't inclusive, you're seeing things go wrong. Um, you know, the, the data shows people, you know, will talk about it being a priority, but when, when things happen, you know, day to day, more than often people sort of turn a blind eye or don't really know how to have those courageous conversations that you're really encouraging. Um, what advice do you have for folks around that? Well, I, I, I would presume, and, and this is a presumption, um, 
that every organization has somebody who is um, thoughtful, sympathetic, and, and understanding of the importance of diversity and inclusion. Um, companies can't survive without that. They can't excel. And so I think the challenge is finding those folks, maybe perhaps, and listening. Um, and so that, that demands you know, visibility, involvement, um, being a part of the organizations that, that aren't just the, the ERGs, but, but all opportunities that present themselves to, to have exposure to listen. I, I get so much out of our companies, um, you know, like town halls and our, our trainings. And I'm a, I'm a joiner. Uh, at and is a joiner's culture. You have to be into doing stuff if you want to get ahead. Um, but that's where I get little insights because I can hear our executives and our leadership talk off the cuff, maybe, or more informal. Um, and, and those are the learnings that are key for me to piecing together the strategy and how I can do, so I'm not, you know, I'm a bunch of levels removed from all that, but how I can execute those ideas at my level is what, what resonates and works. And so I think it's listening. Uh, absolutely, and I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier, Neil. It's, it is, again, it all kind of, at the end of the day, goes back to leadership, right? If leadership and the, the, uh, the tone at the top and from the very top and authentically is about diversity and inclusion, then that leadership team is ready to hear if somewhere, some, and you know, companies like ours and com many other companies, it's the number of employees you have in a multinational it's like it's like a, a big city, you know. You know that's how many people you have, and so there may be pockets here and there where somebody's not really behaving the way they should. And I think we encourage people. We have what's called a cradle hotline, and so if somebody feels like somebody's not living up to the credo, then there is a hotline that anonymously people can call. But that's just one arena. I would say that if we had a hypothetical company X, Y, and Z where the tone at the top uh, was actually not about diversity or inclusion and that you see like at the top people are behaving differently. If I, speaking for myself, and that would be my advice to someone, so this is something I would do for myself, I'm not saying everybody should do it, but my advice then would be, if I were at a company like that, that does the, way the tone at the top and the leadership is not committed, I would leave the company. I would speak up, but if not, I would leave the company. Uh, because if leadership is not committed to it, then you, there is no hope. So if the tone at the top is the right uh, uh, tone, and if it is something that leadership is committed to, then I think you know, they would be willing to listen uh, to the courageous voice that brings up and flags that there's something not right happening. And I think that leadership is willing to listen. It's only if leadership is you know, if the emperor has no clothes, then then you are in an organization that will, you know, you have to decide whether you want to be part of that organization or not. Yeah. Voting with your feet, I know about that. So, okay, great. This has been really, really, really informative. And I'd, lo I'd love at this point to open it up for questions. I want, you know, everyone to leave feeling like you've got a path forward. You know, you know more about Asian women on the rise and also you know, when you see there's a dearth of folks caring about this or doing things about this, particularly at higher levels, but even around you, that you have a sense of what it is that you can do about that. So, you know, tell us, what are your questions? Um, go ahead, Jean. Yeah. So thank you for the great insights. My question is actually for Seema and Shirley. So I think as Asian women, we have kind of the, um, the challenge of um, knowing who we are, right, whatever we identify with the most, and then sort of the other aspect of how people see us. Like how people look at us, how people identify with us, and that kind of thing. Uh, when you think about, uh, when I see you, obviously you go against stereotype in many ways. You're vocal, you have a leadership voice, uh, you probably fight for justice in many, many different ways. What have what has been the reactions right, from people who are different from you about your style uh, and what you bring to the table? I'd love to hear from a personal note uh, what you've received. Um, you know, throughout my career, maybe, you know, mostly I've been fortunate, maybe, or um, for whatever reason, there has never been a negative reaction to how I come across, um, or my opinions. 
uh, and most of my sponsors slash champions and mentors have been not Indian men. Uh, wonder why? No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, no, I'm, I'm. But but you know, my my own father, my husband, uh, both Indian men, were also big, you know, big champions. But so um, so I think that there is one key element that I would say differentiates my experience from some other women I know their experience um, being from a different culture. Uh, we had a recent conversation about it at another conference, and um, what it turns out to be is that the one thing that does not help is having a victim mentality. And the moment you have a victim mentality and you walk around feeling and coming across as victimized, um, it, ha it evokes a negative reaction. Um, and I think we need to sort of move away. That is just, again, my one person's opinion move away from that and actually be a leader and shape it. Um, and yeah, life is full of compromises. Uh, and so uh, are, are we going to achieve the be all and end all for our generation? Maybe not, but if we fight enough, I think that maybe the next generation and then the next generation will benefit from it. So. So I think uh, uh, you know the the climb to Mount Everest uh, is not done you know with one leap, and so you know we can hope to get there quickly. But hundred years is a little too long. <laughs> <laughs> Surely, I um, so reactions for folks to me. I um, so one thing is that I swear a lot. And so I think people tend to think that Asian women, we have, you know, we're like women and then we're Asians, we're just very quiet and we're like, we just go along with things. And so my first project at McKinsey was, was with a, a metals manufacturer. They never worked actually with a McKinsey, like woman who was a, a woman and their, their teams were all men. And I came in and I was like, listen to my manager, I need to always chat, are you okay if I swear in the team room? And he's like, Yes, do you swear? Uh, like he introduced me to everyone being like, sorry about Shirley, she's got quite a mouth on her. So um, the fun thing is when you defy and sort of fuck the stereotype, um, people really perk up. And I, can, I sort of like can kind of get away with it more in terms of um, my language uh, in professional settings. I think the other thing I think a lot about and might resonate with you is that I, I often am, you know, I'm mid thirties and I constantly, people think that I'm 18 and they ask me like, do you know what you're gonna study in, in school? Um, and I say, yes, I've, I've got three degrees. I, I do know what I've studied. Um, and so I tend to have to think when I come into an event like this, am I going to just lean into being you know, who I am or am I going to have to kind of button it up, speak with a deeper voice, you know, do, you know, do all of those sort of like executive vocal co coaching things. And I, I tend to really to think about that before I start any meeting. Is this going to be one where I really, depending on who the audience is, they might not be fully ready for that? Um, or can I actually just bring my full self? And, and more often than not, of course, bringing your, my full self is more fun and I, you know, I think more productive. I, I love that you got permission to swear. <laughs> <laughs> I, always, I ask. Yeah, I like that. Some people are offended. <laughs> Other questions? Am I first or? Okay. Go for it. Thank you for hosting this panel. It's super informative. Um, so I think we've done a really good job in terms of putting the numbers up, right? We see the issues. Yeah. We have creative initiatives that we're implementing at different companies. Question is, how do we measure the impact of those initiatives? So I serve on the steering committee at my firm for the Asian Professional Network, and we're thinking through different initiatives all the time, but how do we actually measure the impact of those initiatives? Is it sitting back and hoping that that reflects in the numbers sometime down the road, hopefully not 100 years later? Or is there something that we can do more regularly, whether it be getting feedback or whatever else approach we can to measure, is this, is this working? Is this training that we're providing executives actually making a direct impact? Um, so curious as to your thoughts there. Um, I'll just start off with just a few reflections and then um, I think you have to start at the local organizational but then also at the global level, right? At, the, at, the, at, the, at a firm, for example, you could, one of the things that we do is we have annual numbers and you may not see too much shifts in annual numbers, but then five years later, 
10 years later, you actually can see um, longitudinal shifts. But that's only one organization. Um, so I think that you know across uh, United States, I'm sure that there are multiple initiatives, but the one thing that I know uh, is something that is being looked at is as part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and gender parity being, uh, and again, it's not yet about diversity, but gender parity being one of the global goals for 2030 that um, that is being looked at as a measurement uh, tool and there's an annual gender summit um, that is going to be looking at ways to come up with measurements, not quite like a census, but really measurement of how do we measure against what becomes known as uh, a check mark against the sustainable development goal of gender parity. Um, and this is something that is being tackled. I don't have an answer yet, but we don't have to wait for that answer. Uh, within our own firms, we can do that, but I think that what we can do across nations, I don't know, uh, you know, Africa, some nations in Africa are actually taking on these initiatives. Uh, some are, you know, better, farther along than others, but I think that the UN Sustainable Development Goals will give us probably a compass for how we can look at this. Well, I, I say the most fundamental <clears throat> measure is attracting and retaining your talent fundamentally um, and, and having a, a methodology for, for um, reporting and analyzing your retention. Um, so, you know, our, our chairman is, is he, he runs our diversity and inclusion council and this is, this is the, the essence of what they are looking at. Um, and, and we are in a you know technology engineering company fundamentally, and so our leadership they're all numbers people, um, and so measurement and, and uh, quantifying impact is expected not just um, in the in the business units that are more easily summed up, um, but also in, in the other science as well, and including our HR and, and our leadership development initiatives. And so I think the bottom line is is promotion, uh, retention. Uh, attrition and, and knowing exactly where you stand against benchmarks, your, your sector and, and the nation of the world. One of the challenges is the self-reporting piece. Yeah, and so as different people feel differently about this, right? So they don't want to check off the box that they're women or Asian or African American. So if you're not self-reporting, then you may or may not have um, that data to, to play with. Um, so that is an inherent challenge. And then I think the other, and I don't call this a challenge, I actually think it's a good thing, is that as we become a global world and there are people who uh, will identify in the future as multiple different things, um, it, we, we, it will be, present a challenge in terms of how do you how do you characterize self-report yourself versus what are you measuring? So gender may be easy because there is still predominantly only male and female and we still don't have, you know, the transgender piece is just now emerging. Um, but in terms of um, mixed marriages and people of mixed origins, unless you go to Ancestry.com and decide to invest in you know, thousand dollars and figure out how what portion of your genome is X percent whatever, and you say, oh, I have to take off my lederhosen and now wear pajamas or whatever. Uh, you become, you are as a human race and human evolution. If you look at the science of the genome and you look at the genomic blueprint of all of us, we are all, and we become more and more and more and more um, uh, mixed. And so how do you, how do you self-report? Um, and then where, how do you track that is gonna be, a, actually, I don't know if it's a challenge, I think it's gonna be an opportunity. And what I'll just add to that, I'm a big data dork, as you can imagine, and so I could list off, if anybody wants to talk about this later, like all the different types of, of data that you can pull on this. Um, more often than not, companies actually so one, there's like a set of companies, um, you know, in terms of consulting that when you start asking about this information, the information is like actually a bit messy. So the data might be there, but like being able to pull the insights of like, okay, where are the pain points? What tenure are we losing people at? Is there like um, 
pull, you know, we've got all these satisfaction questions, but ultimately, have we seen a shift on do people feel comfortable with having a child while they work at this company? Um, some of those like core like inclusion questions, um, we need to be able to actually pull them. And so what I see is more than, a, it, what I always try to do is cut through this sort of data paralysis Right, it can become like a data overload is actually sometimes not the issue in terms of the, the world we're living in now, is how do you pull those insights and make sure that is front of mind for people? And it's really fair for, for you at any level of the organization, whether or not your company shares that interna uh, internally, because you know we don't necessarily share every retention rate um, across our company, to just make, sh make sure that they're, they're looking at that. You know, to, it's, it's, as a, you know, a citizen of your company to say, how often are you looking at this data? What data are you looking at? Do you cut it by race or not? Um, and just to you know, start to, some people might not even realize. Um, the one other fun thing is that when you start to ask a question, one thing that I think you might, might, that comes up when we talk about gender is the second shift and thinking about dual careers. When you look at men at the very top, oftentimes they have stay at home wives and the senior executive women don't necessarily have stay at home husbands. You know, can we dig into that? Can we test that hypothesis? And you can kind of just do like, well, many, um, pulse surveys within your company and quickly get a sense of yeah. whether or not that's an issue. That reminds me a little, just 30 seconds, is that same, I was describing the credo. So we have, we do an annual credo survey and an annual inclusion index within that survey. So everybody who has a direct report population of more than seven, because under seven, then you'd be able to figure out who, who said what, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you have enough, uh, a team of more than seven, you get your results back, and then it's time. It's for you to sort of self reflect whether you, as a leader, have an inclusive culture and an inclusive team. But those kinds of surveys, over time, over time, over time, you want to see, yeah, increases. Um, we had a question in the back, and then we'll come over here. Still, still relevant, or? Um, uh, at Prudential, we're kind of grappling with within part of the agency. Pacific Valley Association with the whole concept of mentorship, sponsorship, the sustainability around that. Um, how do you uh, motivate people to engage wholeheartedly? Like it sounds like you have a number of your executives <coughs> doing, and, um, and and how do you manage with a program that sounds really good, might sound really good at the beginning, but then kind of peters out over time? That's a great question. How many folks have been a part of a mentorship program that was a little bit terrible and did not work? Right? I mean, they're, they're really hit or miss. Yeah, what's the secret sauce of the, the ones that do work? Well, I, so at t has had a lot of success with this, and it, it really comes down to um, opportunities, meaningful opportunities for formal interaction and visibility um, with the top leaders of the company. And so, you know, Prudential's a, a huge company too, and is so at and So our, our senior vice presidents and, and our, our, our business leaders are sort of like celebrities <laughs> within the company and, and are known um, because they, they are our communicators and our ambassadors, both internally and externally. And so um, their involvement is, is critical and, and their involvement, not just in a, a format like this, but where they're at the table with you and, and they're encouraging you to, to feel comfortable to, to challenge assumptions and um, dig into the details. And then that's, look, that's on that, right? I think the, uh, the participants in these forums at at and want that opportunity. It's, it's on the leadership to make folks feel comfortable that that, that that feedback is welcome and it's meaningful, and it is. I mean, is, is you go up into the ranks, that those insights are what drive our business. Um, so I, I, you know, I sort of keep coming back to this refrain about leadership, but it's it's for AT and T. It's been about that access and visibility. Uh, yeah, I think mentorship. This is my personal opinion, not a Johnson and Johnson opinion, but um, I think mentorship is a dated concept. Um, it's a one way. It's a chance to just sit and talk, and it results in no actionable outcomes. Um, so I think the more um, the more um, better way to go. It's better, but it's still not there. It's a sponsorship kind of an approach where it's a two-way interaction with a specific outcome and a specific goal uh, based on a 360 that you do based on your career development goals. And you say, I would like to be X, Y, and Z by X time. However, 
I am not good at A, B, C, or D, and therefore I need someone to work with me on A, on B, on C, and on D. And so it's sort of an active involvement by the person who wants to grow and an active involvement by the people who want to help to see them grow as part of a talent development program with specific desired outcomes and maybe a five years from now, I would like to see be in this position. So then it works, but this sort of, let's get together for some tea and let me pour my heart out to you and why am I not prom getting promoted? Does, does not work. Um, at all, and so um, mentorship seems like a one way. I and it just like you know that that's my opinion. I feel like it's a concept that without like real out, it has to be outcomes based toward a goal. Then it could work. I was just going to make one comment. Um, I, I used to be at IBM and. We were in our 92nd year as a company, and we had never had a woman as a country general manager in Asia in 92 years, right? So uh, just a quick thing, you know, because you mentioned, like, what can we do? Mm -hmm. So this is just a quick idea. I was on the Asian Women you know, Diversity Council, and um, the general manager of Asia said, I have a good idea, and this is where sometimes, you know, it's a tactical idea for a strategic change. He said, um, every time we have a new opening for a country general manager, we're going to have three of the best candidates come to me uh, as a proposed candidate. If none of those three are women, then just give me the best woman possible. And then at the meeting, we'll discuss why, what is she lacking. And that turned into a development plan for that woman. Three years later, when I left, when I was 96 years old, we had four women country general managers, you know, of Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. Now, those are the largest countries, but I just want to say that there was a two-year development program, and a woman in Indonesia had to leave her family um, and go to Singapore to be in the ASEAN headquarters because there was some development she needed to actually run the country. And with that proactive thinking, her husband agreed, and you know they made arrangements. But it actually is, you know, a tactical way. You know, you need a tactical yeah. idea to actually get strategic um, kind of progress. Yeah. But I just want you to know, three years later, we have four. So 96 wow. years old, finally have That's four. Amazing. So it's a, it's a thought. Yeah. Thank you. I think time's up. <laughs> I just have a follow-up question from Chloe, if that's okay. Was there a common thread amongst those four women? Oh, good question. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they swore. <laughs> 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 but you know, the thing about it is, I'll tell you the common thread. They all did. Efficiency, like, were they all efficient in, in the same areas? No, you know, the deficiency was experience. And being in their home country, they couldn't always get it. Yep. So some of them had to move to Tokyo to the Asia headquarters. Some of them had to move to Singapore to the ASEAN. But a lot of times in your local environment, you can't get it. So if women just don't want to go to New York, and that's where your headquarters is. So I had to leave my family for most of my life. Not my immediate family, but I, my parents. Do you know what I mean? I've had to, I moved to Japan to be the head of m a for Asia way far away. I moved to Armagh. You know, to be the corporate head. And we, we've seen that in, uh, in many geographies when we think about managing a global workforce. You know, our, our, our colleagues in like LATAM, for example, they've got to travel all over to get the same exposure. So we realize we also need to bring folks to them. Can we bring North America that, you know, not always just making yeah. the entire burden on the folks yes. that are already kind of, you know, facing that uphill challenge. Great. Well, thank you so much, Seema and Neil. Thank you, everybody here. Great questions. I hope you